Well, good morning, church. Great to see all your smiling faces here this morning. I uh, just want to first acknowledge and honor Pastor Al and Pastor Jackie for uh, just giving me this opportunity this morning to, to share the Word of uh, God with you guys. Um, something I don't take lightly and um, I'm truly humbled and grateful for the opportunity. So uh, I want to thank you. Um, but hey, um, good morning. And my name's Smitty, if I haven't met you. Um, together with my wife Jade and our two little boys, uh, Lucas and Jericho at the back there, you know, we love that we get to uh, call this place home. Um, you know, moving from Brisbane where there's a thousand traffic lights to here in Lismore where there's a thousand roundabouts. You know, I don't know which one's better, but um, I think my wife likes the, the roundabouts more. She always reminds me every time we turn down the street, babe, stop, there's another roundabout coming. So, thanks, Dal, appreciate it. Um, but hey, this morning, um, I kind of want to get straight into it because I know God wants to speak to some people here this morning. Um, and I just love where I'm sharing from this morning because the story we're about to read is a, uh, is, a, is a beautiful picture of the Father's heart, not only for us, but, but for all humanity. Um, you know, I've probably read this story about a hundred times now, but because of where I'm at in, in my life, you know, probably this week, um, being a father now to two boys, two sons. Um, you know, this story has ministered to me like never before. Um, and I just pray this morning that this revelation and the power of the word, in fact, I know it will be transferred to you because it's a story of the, the father's unconditional love for, for us. It's a story of his goodness and his kindness and his grace towards his children. But not only that, it's a story and a, and a great reminder for everyone here in this place this morning that no matter where you've been in life, no matter what path you've chosen, no matter what uh, decisions you've made, you know, this, to, to, this morning is a reminder that nobody is beyond redemption and nobody is full of sin that he or she cannot be made clean by God, no matter who you are. And that's the goodness and the kindness of God. Amen. <sighs> So before we get into it, I want to just first by, I want to start by asking you a question. Just something I want to just, um, I want you to be thinking about as we get into this message this morning. And my question is this, you know, what does God think of you? You know, what does God think of you? you know, what, what is God's opinion of you? You know, when God thinks of you, does he think about all your, um, all your silly mistakes you've made or does he rejoice in the person that he's making you become? You know, when God thinks of you, does he think about your past, all the things you've done wrong or does he, you know, does he rejoice in your future? You see, how you answer these questions this morning will, will, will impact the way you see God. Because if you see God as this um, demanding taskmaster, then you'll probably approach God with hopelessness. You know, if you see God as a, um, if you see God as someone that's always judging or always pointing the finger or always highlighting the, the, your faults, then you'll probably, uh, you'll probably approach God with fear and you'll probably never come to him. But if you see God this morning as a loving father, then this morning you have a choice to make. You know, how will you approach him? Will you approach him with uh, love and openness or will you turn and run? How will you approach God? And so this morning I want to talk to you about how God sees us and how we can see others. Amen? And I want to do that by just looking at a familiar passage of scripture to many of us. You know, and if you've been around church long enough, you definitely know this story, and it's the story of the lost son. You might know it as the prodigal son. A familiar story, but I want to look at it in an unfamiliar way and just see what we can discover about the Father's heart for us. Amen? And so um, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Luke 15, or you can just follow uh, with me on the screens back on, just behind me. And so here it starts off with the, the parable of the lost sheep, and then it goes on to the lost coin, and then finishes with the, with the lost son. And I just love how Jesus would tell these parables, you know, these stories. He would tell these um, stories to the people of the day so that they, they, they could uh, get an understanding of what the kingdom of God was like. 
Yeah? And so each of these stories would highlight a, highlight a, a specific area about God or God's people or, or about God's kingdom. And so it was simply a story that told a, a, a biblical truth. So we have these three parables kind of explaining the same thing. So let's dive straight in. Verse 1, it says this. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. I just want to, I want to stop, I want to stop us right there. It says this. I want you to think about this for a second. It says, tax collectors and notorious sinners often came. Not just sinners, it says notorious sinners. Like people that were, you know, famous for sin. You know, it says they often came to hear Jesus teach, you know. So where did Jesus teach? He taught up in the mountains, taught up in, in the synagogues. He uh, taught on the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus would basically have these church services, right? And watch the people that came and felt welcome at those services were notorious sinners. You know, the bad of the bad, you know, people famous for doing wrong. Very important. It goes on to say, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So right off the bat, you know, watch this. You, know, you notice that Jesus and religion have two very different ideas of what, about what church is. Amen? And how church should be done, right? You see that. And so what's happening here is that these tax collectors, you know, these, these notorious sinners are just so drawn to the word. They begin to realize, man... There's, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for us, guys. You know, there's, there's, there's hope for us. And so these lost and broken people are listening, and, and the first people that are offended are the religious people, you know, who think they got it all figured out. And they begin to complain and, and mutter to each other and talk amongst each other about these sinners. And, and Jesus sees this. And Jesus knows, and he, he sees right through people's hearts, you know, like the Bible says. And it's like Jesus is directing these parables to these Pharisees, and it's like, He's saying, guys, you have no idea what my kingdom is of. Amen? You've, got, you've missed the whole point, guys. And so these religious leaders were trying to you know, divide people into two classes, the clean and the unclean. And so Jesus tells them this story. All right, church, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to do some reading this morning. This is church. <laughs> Here we go. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and turns, returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? She will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, with me because I've found my lost coin. In the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. You see, let me tell you what Jesus is about here. Jesus is about reaching and rejoicing. He's about reaching and rejoicing, and he's demonstrating the heart of the Father right here in these parables. And so as, as I was reading, you know, this section of, of, of this chapter, I thought to myself, you know, why does heaven rejoice? You know, why is there such a joy in heaven when one sinner repents and, and returns to God? And I thought to myself, you know, God, you know, God has, a, has a, universe, a universe to run. You know, he has galaxies uh, to uphold, you know, governments and nations to, to rule under his mighty hand. But, but notice how you don't see heaven rejoicing over these things. You know, don't get me wrong. You know, God takes pleasure in all that he does. But here Jesus is referring to something very, very special. That when one sinner repents and gives his or heart to God, the heavens, the heavens erupt. And there is a joy in heaven. And so I got curious And I had a look through the Bible of times when we see heaven rejoicing. And I want to share with you. I want to share this. Uh, the Bible only mentions five things that make the angels in heaven rejoice, which I wrote down. So the first time we see, so five things. The first time we see heaven rejoicing is when God said, let there be light in the book of Job. The second was the night Jesus was born in Luke 2. The third time we see heaven rejoicing is when a sinner Gives all his or her heart to the Lord, which we just read about. The fourth 
is when the church arrives in heaven in Revelations. The fifth time we see heaven rejoicing is when the Lord defeats his enemies on earth and returns to reign in Revelations 19. Amen? And so comparing to these you know, other great events, you can see how important the salvation of each believer is to our God. Amen? That in, in spite of his majesty, his holiness, his greatness, he simply just cares for his children one at a time. You know, just like the lost sheep that we just read about who went wandering, you know, they went astray. Jesus said, I'm going to leave the 99 and go after the one that is lost. I'm going to go after the one that is vulnerable. I'm going to go after the one that is alone, scared. And you know the important principle about that whole story is that Jesus knew there were exactly 100 sheep. He knew. And so when you think about it, when the sheep were coming back in, he knew that one was missing. Amen? So this morning, I want to tell you that every single number matters to God. Every single person matters to God. It matters to him. Everyone here this morning matters to God. Those of you who are tuning, on, tuning online, you matter to God. Which leads us to the parable of the lost son, which I want to share. So here we go. Verse 11, it says this, to illustrate this point further. In other words, look, Jesus wants to drive his point home here. He's like, guys, you've got to listen to this story. Especially to the, the Pharisees and, and, and the religious leaders who were, who were listening in at, at the time. You see, if there's anything we need to understand about the heart of God is that God's heart for people, God's heart for the lost, God's heart for humani huma humanity and the lengths that God is willing to go for for that one person to come back and, and be in right, right relationship with him. So to illustrate this point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want, a sh I want my share of your estate now before you die. Basically, the son, what the son was saying is, Dad, I wish you were dead. You know, in Bible times, you would not even ask that question. You don't, that's, it's a disrespectful thing to ask your dad for your portion of your inheritance. And so what he was doing was like, whoa, where, where is this coming from? He, want, he wanted what was coming and he, he wanted it now. And I want you out. He's pretty much saying, Dad, I want you out of my life. So the fa his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. Church, remember this. You may be here this morning and you think... You might think your sin is fun for a season, but I'm telling you, it will bring you pain in the end. You see, what I've learned in life is that the enemy will always try to keep you longer than you want to stay and cause you more pain than you want to happen. It says he persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Notice here that the younger, younger brother, he's, he's pretty much talking to himself here. He's pretty much reached rock bottom in his life. Nowhere else to go. He's in a pit and he starts preaching to himself. You know, sometimes when you, you find yourself in a, in a bad situation or you find yourself in a pit, guys, you need to, you need to silence the thoughts of the vo and the voices of the enemy and start preaching the word of God over yourself, declaring his promises. You know, I love this. He says, it says he returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to his father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals on his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine who was dead and has now returned to life 
He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. See, this morning I want to talk to you about how God sees us. Let me pray for us this morning. So Father, we thank you for your, your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have so much to reveal to us this morning. Thank you that we all have a story and, all, and we're all uh, on a journey discovering your faithfulness, your goodness, and your love for us each day. And Lord, in these next few moments, I just pray that you would just silence the voice of the enemy in every mind that right now, through your word, they would hear your voice and see your heart for them and for people. Help me to deliver this message in a way that honors you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, I love this story. It's such a good story because we get this picture of this father and his two sons, right? And so the younger son decides to leave home and he gets all crazy. And can, any, can anybody relate to that? Anyone ever wasted some money and time and energy? You know, looking back on my own life, I just remember making some silly, silly decisions, you know. But more than that, there was much more severe things in my life that if I continued to live in, now, who knows where I'd be right now? And if it wasn't for God's divine intervention, um, I probably wouldn't be standing here right now, to be honest. He's so good. He is so good. And, and that's what sin does. You know, sin, sin separates us from God. You know, you begin to isolate yourself from everyone else. You, be, you begin to do things in your own strength. Uh, sin takes us away from home. It takes us away from church, from, from the people that are trying to help and encourage you. Verse 13 says, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant country. You know, just like the son who got up and moved to a distant country, I'm sure for us, if, if you had to be honest with yourself, you know, I'm sure there's times in, your, in our lives where we've, we've tried to run and hide from God. Amen? And so a distant country represented here in the story for us could be any place you go in your heart, any place you go in your mind where you don't want God to know you're there. Now, you don't want the Father to see you. And we all know our distant countries, yeah? And so does God. You see, none of that is a surprise to him. He knows all, yet he loves us the most. And this morning, I just believe there are people here, here that are, I, I believe people that are going to come to their senses and you're going to come back to God because you're going to realize how much God loves you. And you're going to realize that whatever you thought you wasted your, your sin on or your shame, you see, listen, none of that matters to him. All that matters to God is that, you know, we come back home where we belong. And I know there are many reasons why we shouldn't come home. Now, we can think of probably a million reasons why God should be ashamed of us. Because we all know our stories, right? We all know our past. We all know our present. We all know our mistakes, our, our habits, our sins. Now, all these things keep us away from, from the plans God has, has for us, you know. But I believe one of the reasons people don't want to come home is because they're afraid of God's judgment. And they haven't heard about, the, about his love. Because there's fear there. There's, there's, there's fear of his judgment. But, but also, I believe even more people don't want to come home is because they're afraid of our judgment. The rules and the regulations and the conditions... Oh, no, they're not going to fit in. No, they're not going to measure up. No, it's not going to work out for them. You know, they, they feel they're going to be judged by their older brothers in the church, just like the story. You know, the self-righteous ones, you know. And so they choose to stay away and say things like, oh, I don't fit there. I don't belong there. I'm not worthy enough to be there. And that's probably what the older brother would have said to his younger brother if he probably saw him first in the story. You know, what are you doing back home? And who do you think you are? You know, what, what makes you think you can just come home after all you've done? All the mistakes you've made. You know, you hurt our dad. You hurt our family. See, church, let's, let's not be that guy. Let's not be that guy. You know, I remember the day I got baptized. Um, one of the happiest days of my life, but also a day I'll, I'll never forget because of what someone said to me after, after that service. Um, I'll never forget it. Yes, you know, I forgave this person in my heart, which was you know, the right thing to do, but I'll still remember it. 
And so I get baptized in Gladstone uh, Church where I was attending when I was living up there. Um, and after sharing my testimony after the service, this guy comes up to me and he says, you know, oh man, you messed up. <laughs> like he literally, and, he's, and he said, oh, I hope you can clean yourself up and get back on track. Like, and I was like, oh. Um, you know, that really hurt because you just got baptized. <laughs> um, yeah, and, um, and in that moment, I walked away questioning, you know, God's love for me again because of my past and, and my mistakes. And it only took a, a, a few words from someone to change my whole perspective of, of where I stood with God once again. But you know what I've learned is that it's not my idea of holiness that he's looking for. It's not that man's idea of righteousness as well. You see, the Bible says our idea of righteousness is like filthy rags to God. You see, it's his holiness in us, and he provides it through his grace and what Jesus did for us on that cross. You know, that while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. You see, you don't make yourself holy by, by changing your behavior. God makes us holy by making us innocent. And that truth that you don't change in order to be accepted by God. Nah, you're just accepted by him when you realize the amazing grace that was poured out for you on that cross. That nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross we cling. Amen? And that truth can have a huge impact on how you see yourself and how we see others and how we see people that are not followers of Jesus. And so we're going to see how the rest of this story plays out. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one goat, one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed with me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost but now he is found. See, church, the last thing I want you to see in the story is that both sons were lost. And if the team want to come up, you see, both sons were lost. They both saw themselves as, as slaves. You know, the younger son, the rebel, he said, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just let me be one of your servants. The older son said, all these years I've been slaving for you. He was a self-righteous one. None, not, none of them understood who they were, right? The younger son left home, but the older son never really was home to, to begin with. You know, he was so close to his father, yet so, still so far away from him, you know? Yet the father went out to look for both of them. Verse 20. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. I love this. The son, yeah, the son decides to come home, and he doesn't even get to the front yard, and the Bible says that while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. You know what that tells me? That every single day that father would come out. He would come out of his house and he would just he would just wait. And he would just wait. You know, you think about your, your, your son or your daughter. You know, he would just wait. You see, God is so patient with us. You know, he hasn't left you anywhere. He's just waiting and he looks down the road. And here comes his son. And the Bible says the father, watch, not the son, the father ran to him. And before the son even got one word out, before he even said, sorry, dad, before he even repented, before he even 
said anything. The father ran out to him and hugged him and kissed him and embraced him. And I love this next part. The father says, quick, get a robe on my son. In other words, I don't want him to feel any more dirt or shame. You see, the robe represents righteousness. He's in right relationship with me now. Then he said, put a ring on his finger, which represents authority. Put sandals on his feet. You see, in Bible times, only slaves and and servants went barefoot. In other words, he's saying, son, you're not a slave anymore. And so in that moment, he restores his dignity and he provides for him. Amen. You see, how do you respond to a love like that? What do you do with a love like that? And so I come back to my question I asked at the start. You know, what does God think of you? What's his opinion of you? And how do you see him? And how are you going to respond? Amen. And so this morning, you can make a decision that you can either keep running from God or you can, choose to, you can choose to ignore it and say things like, oh, that's too good to be true. No, that's not for me. That's for other people. That's, that can't be for me. Or you can surrender and give yourself over and, and you can allow yourself to be loved by the Heavenly Father. Amen? It's your choice. And so here's what I want us to see in the story. And it's actually, it's actually something we don't see in the story. And it's what, it's what happens next. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us if the younger son, you know, stuck around or if he changed his life or if he behaved himself. No, we don't know. We don't know if the older, older son forgave his brother or welcomed, back, welcomed him back home to the family. We actually don't know because I love how Jesus ends it right there. And he leaves it open for us because we are the ones in this story. We are the ones in this story. Church, why don't you stand with me? This morning, I just want to give um, people the opportunity to choose to come home. So you're not coming home to the anger of God. No, you're coming home to the love of God. And all you got to do is Come to your senses, just like that younger son did. He had an awareness in him and said, man, I'm in the pits. I can't do this on my own. I need my Savior. Put that pride aside and say, I'm nothing without you, God. I need you. He realized he had nowhere else to go. Amen. And so I want us to pray together this morning and let's, you know, let's deal with this right now. So would you just bow your heads and just close your eyes and in this moment um, moment of prayer, I just want to address those in the room who are here this morning or listening online and you've heard this message and you can actually relate to maybe the older brother, not the younger son, the older brother, that perhaps you've been a bit too harsh or, or too demanding. You know, are you, uh, are you pointing the finger of judgment or are you extending a, a, a hand of compassion? Now, is God speaking to you about how you see the lost ones in your life? And if that's you, just place your hand on your heart and just take a moment and just deal with that and just confess it to God. Bring it before the Lord this morning. Tell Him, yes, I've been wrong and I see. Just talk to God for a minute and ask Him to give you the Father's heart for the lost. The Father's heart for the lost. Now, I want to also speak to those who may be here this morning and you could probably identify yourself as the lost son, the one that ran away. And you're far from God and you've been out there away from God in that crazy, you know, wasteful living. And this morning you're hurting and you know it's your day to come home. And I want to say the, the Father's right here watching. He's waiting. He hasn't left you. He's ready to put that robe on you and tell you, hey, it's okay. And that He accepts you. This morning, allow yourself to be embraced by the love of the Father because, you know, He just wants you home. That's all He wants. And if that's you, just put your hand on your heart. And and I just invite you just to pray with me. You don't have to say anything out loud. Just pray in your heart or in your mind. And say this, Heavenly Father, I want to come home. 
I've been in a distant country. I'm tired of running and I've been doing things on my own. And I, don't, I, don't want to do, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to experience your love for me. I want my dignity back. I want my identity, my authority. And even though I'm not worthy to be, be called your son or your daughter, this morning I'm receiving your gift right now of salvation, your forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Even though I don't understand it, I just know how desperately I need you. This morning, I open my heart to you and I choose to come home. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, the team are just going to sing a song over you this morning. and I just encourage you to reflect. And if you feel you need some prayer at the end of the service, feel free to come up. We're gonna, there will be a team up here ready to pray for you. But... Um, Just allow yourself to be embraced by by the Father this morning and be loved by Him. Amen.